This episode of the Troxel Podcast is made possible with support from Arc IT. Are you tired of standard IT services that miss the mark? Choose Arc IT for specialized, proactive IT management, BIM support, and robust data security tailored for architects. Whether you're a team of 10 or a growing firm of 50 plus, Arc IT understands the architecture industry and will empower your unique creative vision to enable you to do your best work. Embrace a technology team that enhances, not hinders, your design process. Visit getarcit.com for your free IT assessment and start transforming your firm and your tech experience today. That's G-E-T-A-R-C-H-I-T dot com. Welcome to the Troxel Podcast. I'm Evan Troxel. In this episode, I am joined once again by David Benjamin from Autodesk and Thomas Van Heren from Ecovative in the final installment in this three-part series on Project Phoenix. Thomas Van Heren is Ecovative's chief operating officer, where he is responsible for the raw materials and mycelium composite business lines across the United States and Europe. Ecovative is scaling its mycelium technology to provide an alternative for industrial farming and to replace plastics. You know, no big deal, right? He graduated from London School of Economics and holds an MBA from Columbia Business School. David Benjamin leads applied research on net zero buildings at Autodesk Research. His work combines research and practice with a focus on an expanded and actionable framework of environmental sustainability. Over the past several years, his team has explored generative design, low carbon materials, and reusable design intelligence for the built environment. Today, we are discussing the journey of creating sustainable building materials using mycelium, the history of Autodesk and Ecovative's partnership, and the evolution from demonstration projects to scalable solutions, insights on the importance of digital workflows, the challenges and innovations in building facades, and the incredible versatility of mycelium as a materials platform. And we also talk about the potential of mycelium to revolutionize various industries and the urgent need for scalable, carbon-negative solutions in architectural building materials and beyond. Before we get into today's conversation, once again, please do me a couple of favors if you haven't already. If you're enjoying these episodes, please subscribe to the show on YouTube and in your favorite podcast app to let me know that you're a fan. And if you're watching on YouTube, please click that like button too, just under the video. It really helps. And finally, if you'd like to get an email when episodes are published with all of the links and other information about the episode and the guests, sign up at trxl.co, where you can find every episode of the show, including parts one and two of this series. This was a fantastic conversation with Thomas and David, and I hope you'll not only find value in it for yourself, but that you'll help add value to the profession by spreading it. So now without further ado, I bring you my conversation with Thomas Van Heren and David Benjamin for the final part three of the Project Phoenix series. Today, I'm joined by David Benjamin and Thomas Van Heren, and David works at Autodesk, Thomas works at Ecovative, and these are both companies that have come together on Project Phoenix, which we've talked about in the past on previous episodes. Today, I'm especially excited because as an architect, we're going to be talking about building materials and unconventional building materials at that. I'm going to to bury the lead for a few more minutes here until we hear about this interesting um, new development, at least new to me. And uh, I'm going to let you start, David. And if you could tell us kind of the, about this partnership between Autodesk and Ecovative, how long that's been going on? Is this the first project that you've collaborated together on? I, ha- I have a, a burning sense that the answer is no. I mean, it takes a while to, to come to something this innovative. So kick us off with a story about how this partnership was started. Great. Um, well, thanks, Evan. Um, So for me, the story began about 10 years ago um, when I was working on a project with my team um, as part of an an invited competition run by the Museum of Modern Art uh, called the Young Architects Program. And this was a a really interesting program that invited young architecture firms, kind of unproven architecture firms, to propose an innovative idea for a pavilion in the courtyard of MoMA PS1 uh, for the summer. 
And at the time, uh, we were very interested in sustainability, in materials, and particularly in biomaterials. And um, we came across the amazing things that Ecovative was doing with materials. And Ecovative was basically, and Thomas, you can describe more about this uh, in a moment, but Ecovative was um, creating materials, functional, useful materials out of mycelium, which is the root-like structure of mushrooms, and agricultural waste, which is like the byproduct of growing corn or other crops. And Ecovative was taking this stuff and making materials for packaging and maybe some other applications. And we thought, being architects, um, that we would love to use this same material to make bricks, to make architectural load-bearing bricks to make a structure. And uh, we got in contact with Ecovative and took the train from New York City up to their facility in upstate New York and kind of proposed our idea. And uh, Ecovative, um, I think it was Evan and Gavin at the time, Thomas, and, and they... Uh, uh, kind of listened to our proposal and thought it was pretty interesting. We talked about, you know, different uh, strengths of the material, different ways that the Ecovative makes it. And at the end, they basically said, well, we're probably going to pass. Um, they, you know, they they thought that, um, that they didn't necessarily want to uh, get involved in that project. And I learned later a little, some of the reasons, some of the challenges for that, some of the difficulties of different markets and liability issues and things like that. But in the end, after more discussion, some back and forth, us kind of pleading our case a little more um, and some testing that we did, um, we figured out that we we actually could make um, a structure out of this material. And uh, we created a 40 foot tall tower um, uh, out of about 10,000 bricks. So I always think mm like more than just a, a few units, more than just one story building to test out whether this material making load bearing bricks out of mycelium material could actually work. And it was generally, um, you know, pretty successful, pretty well received. Um, and just to, to kind of wrap up the story, we can, we can talk about any details of that if it's, if it's relevant, but this was uh, almost 10 years ago exactly. And uh, because the project was at MoMA, it got a lot of attention at, from architects, but really more attention probably from the general public. And one of the questions that I was asked most frequently at that time was something like, uh, yeah, this is interesting, but when is this going to be in a real building? And, <laughs> right. you know, it was like annoying <laughs> to me. We had worked so hard just to get this like thing and it was big and, you know, sure. it, it took so much engineering. We had other partners, including the uh, great structural engineers at Arup and, uh, you know, great people building with us in New York City, brick masons stacking this thing. You know, we did all this hard work and people were kind of dismissing it. But at the same time, I knew that was exactly the right question to be asking. Well, you made it, you obviously just made it look easy, right? Like this was one of those things where it's like, well, it nobody sees the 10 year long struggle to success. They only see the success part, right? And so yes. building materials are proven over time. And so there's this probably this automatic assumption, right? Which is which is like, okay, where are we going next, right? It, we're always, where are we going next? So I, I, I love that it kind of perturbed you a little bit because you're like, you don't even know what it took to get here, right? <laughs> right? Let's talk about like how, yeah, how far we've come and but people just right. wanted, you know, but but I knew that that that, that was, uh, you know, the right question. And I think at the time I said something like, you know, because I had learned from from Ecovative about this material and the possibilities. And I said, you know, based on my experience in the past year, you know, bringing this to life, um, I'm pretty confident that in about 10 years, you know, we'll be able to have this in, in a real building, in a real permanent, yes. you know, regular functional mm -hmm. building. I did not necessarily think that I would uh, be part of a team with you, Thomas, and others to to bring that to life. But you know, and and both Ecovative and you know, and me and my team, we did many different things over those ten years. But we've come back together just recently um, to to try to bring this to life in a real building. That's fantastic. 
I had no idea that it went back that far. And and so Thomas, now I'm I'm really interested in where you enter the picture, right? Because now now David kind of painted that story of of how you got to to maybe where we are and where we're going with with Project Phoenix and what we saw at Autodesk University. But tell us your story and how you got involved at Ecovative. Yeah, and, and just going back briefly to what David just said about, you know, people asking, you know, when is this an actual building? You know, it's interesting because you know, you need some visionary people who see it, who see the application, who actually see the future. And then, you know, obviously we always refer to David as uh, being one of them and, you know, the early er, the early adepts are when it comes to building materials. But at the same time, you know, Ecovative has now been around for uh, 16, almost 17 years. Uh, and we joke internally that we are the world's leading uh, mycelium construction materials business, yet we have never used... Um, any mycelium materials in an actual building. So it tells you, it kind of shows you how long it takes for something like that to be um, not just to gain interest, right? Because there's a lot of interest in mycelium, there's a lot of interest in, in kind of the technology, um, but bringing it to life in a real life project is a different uh, story. Uh, yeah, that's that's really where we are today. And yes, that took 10 years or, or, or longer than that because uh, and I guess maybe that's uh, maybe that's a good segue to explaining kind of how Ecovative got there. Um, so the business was founded by uh, Eben Bayer and uh, Gavin McIntyre back in 2008, uh, right out of college, uh, the uh, inventors class, where they came up with a way to bind agricultural waste materials using mycelium as uh, agriculture as a, as, a, as kind of nature's glue, right? So it's a binding process mm-hmm. uh, where the mycelium. Um, self-assembles and, and binds together agricultural waste products. Um, initially, uh, that was actually focused on two things, um, aging and building materials. And we have made uh, things, uh, a variety of things in, in the building and construction materials space, uh, ranging from uh, e-wood and bricks to insulation. Uh, and so we have spent uh, kind of a long period of time since the inception uh, of the business, um, trying to commercialize that product uh, as well as our packaging uh, product. Um, along the way, you know, you, you kind of start to find out how hard it is, specifically in industries like packaging uh, and like construction materials, um, how long the cycles are, right? So it takes a very long time to get first people to buy into the product, uh, to test it themselves, to validated as a useful uh, and valid uh, alternative material. And then you need to go through the entire cycle of, you know, getting it proved and, you know, having people actually utilize it and value it in a way um, that fits with how Ecovative values it, right? And mm-hmm. so along the way, we came up with different technologies to use my system as well. Um, today, uh, our largest products are actually not what we call the microcomposites technology, which um, we're talking about today, Um, but we are focused largely on growing 100% mycelium tissue slabs in a traditional uh, mushroom growing facility that we harvest and either treat into uh, bacon, a vegan bacon, uh, under our brand name My Forest Foods, um, or into leather, systematic farms. So those are slightly different than the technology we're talking about today, um, that is 100% mycelium, microcomposites. Mycelium is just one of the ingredients, right? Mm, mm-hmm. um, and so, yeah, when David came to us um, to kind of take a look again at um, building materials, really, we would have said no to everyone except for to David, because David is one of those people who has uh, who has a long-standing history with us, um, and uh, who has the vision to bring that to life. And so uh, I think about a year ago, David, we started talking about how do we bring uh, mycelium uh, panels into um, the market as an alternative for um, EPS foam. And mm. so that's what we've been working on since. Thomas, I'm glad you're reminding me and, and everyone else of the amazing other things that can be created with mycelium. And, and that's... That's a whole other, that's a, just a, such a mind-blowing thing that one living organism, you know, can be used in one way for food, in another way for packaging, in another way for building materials, in another way for clothing-like uh, materials. Um, 
But I just wanted to emphasize that um, something that's been really important for me is I, I think my thinking changed over the past 10 years. I'm just as excited about mycelium materials as I was 10 years ago. But um, one, one part of the equation for me is the importance of going from demonstration project to scale up. And 10 years ago, I was more focused on demonstration project. And, and the world needs good demonstration projects in innovation. But especially in decarbonization and climate and architecture, we need to rapidly scale up. You know, we can't just have another 10 years of good demonstration projects without the scale up. We need the demonstration projects, but we equally need the scale up. So when we started talking together again, Thomas, a, you know, a year ago or so, we were very much focused on the scale up, not only on getting this in a real building, but on what I have been calling like a drop-in solution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, something that can be used with today's building codes and, and certifications and construction processes it can be dropped right in, you know, kind of like biofuel can be dropped in to today's vehicles and we can start using it today. So we were interested in, I mean, in a way, Phoenix is both. It's a demonstration project, but it's also a critical step on this scale up because if we can make it in this real building and get through all of those, you know, steps to prove that it can be done, then we hope it will unlock, you know, a, a lot more scale up. Yeah. To your point, David, I think a lot of people have probably watched the Fantastic Fungi documentary on, on Netflix and, and the application of mycelium is incredible, right? Like across the, the range. And I mean, going back to Ecovative's beginnings is you said that this started out as a as a research project in school. Was that right? So like, how did that wh where did this initial spark to pursue potentially building products, I assume at that time, maybe maybe there was like a giant map on the wall of all the, the opportunities and, and there was like focusing in, but was it the two founders who were just like inspired to say, how can we apply this to building products? I mean, that it's just incredible to think of how far this has come in, yeah. in what is really a relatively short amount of time. Yeah, and, and Evan tells this story much better, obviously because it's his experience, um, mm -hmm. but he grew up on a farm and kind of took that knowledge uh, with him to college. And when he did a um, an inventor's class with Bert Swersey, uh, a professor at uh, RBI, um, they came up with uh, using mycelium as, uh, as a natural glue. Uh, I think he's done that course once and the second time around, Gavin joined him. Uh, and then that they uh, spun after college, they spun that business uh, or that project really into a business. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, to, to answer your question on, uh, you know, when, how does that go? Right. I think it's, uh, it's as many startups, um, you start working on one thing and that leads you to the next thing. Uh, mm -hmm. and that's really a very simplistic way of explaining, um, how Ecovative evolved throughout the years as well. Right. Before, because, um, before Ecovative, there was no mycelium industry, you know, mycelium as an alternative material did not exist before Evan and Gavin came up with this product uh, back in, in 2007 or 2008. Um, really, mycelium was only used for, um, you know, inoculating substrate for the commercial mushroom growing industry, uh, not for using mycelium. And eventually, the mycelium would pin into a mushroom, right? Um, it was not used as an alternative material before they started working on this. Today, there are tons and tons of uh, startups and businesses working on mycelium with mycelium, yeah. uh, whether that's with our patents and with our IP or not. Um, you know, there's a lot of interest in it and, uh, you know, partially triggered by documentaries like uh, Fantastic Fungi and there's a bunch of other ones out there as well. Um, but to really drive that point home, you know, the evol Ecovate evolving as a business from packaging and, and, uh, and building materials to bacon and leather that all, you know, obviously went like this, but it's one invention that led to the next one, right? So mm -hmm. um, if you look at our material, for example, the bricks that we use, 
there's a thin layer of what we call overgrowth uh, on the microcomposites products. Um, and that overgrowth is 100% mycelium. And that led, led us to the innovation to use 100% mycelium as an alternative material as well. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely a very, very interesting path. Um, we have a lot of licensees around the world. Uh, last year, uh, September, we actually decided to open the microcomposites patent uh, in Europe, Europe, the UK, and Israel uh, under uh, the open patent program for that particular region. Um, and we did that to, you know, get the technology into more people's hands um, to drive more innovation. Uh, and because there was so much interest, particularly coming from Europe, and um, with people who wanted to get their hands on the material and the technology, and we decided that it would be best uh, for, for that technology to be shared with more people so that we drive more innovation. And to David's point, you know, get to a faster adaptation of using that material in real life, right? Because we're definitely not there yet, specific, in particular with uh, the composites technology. Um, we're a long way from having all the uh, EPS and styrofoam and packaging being replaced by, uh, uh, by mycelium-based uh, packaging. And um, we're probably further away uh, on construction material, uh, construction materials. To be fair, mm -hmm. so there's there's a lot of innovation and a lot of scaling up that needs to happen. Uh, and I tell actually everyone in Europe that I speak with about our open patent program, I tell all of them: don't focus on substrate, don't focus on the strain, focus on scalability. You need to figure out a way to scale this to make it as cost competitive as your EPS or, you know, your, your incumbent materials. That is the only way in which you're going to build this into a real business and make an impact. Um, but in the end, it will have to be uh, adopted by, um, you know, people like David and people like Factory OS and, you know, the architects behind the project. And yeah, we're really excited to see um, the excitement uh, on the Phoenix project. It's had a lot of, a lot of exposure and people are really genuinely excited about it. So yeah, it's great to be part of that. This episode is made possible with support from Avail. Avail makes the best software to manage all of your AEC digital content. Dedicated to developing tools that save AEC teams time, Avail has now added Revit application version management to its suite of content management capabilities. Once a painful manual process, Revit application versioning is now automatic for Avail customers. Publishers simply upload files to an Avail channel, and the files are automatically converted to newer versions from Revit 2021 through Revit 2025. For users, the experience is then seamless. They can search, select, and utilize the Revit content in Avail, regardless of what Revit version they are working in. Inquire about a demo of Avail and its new Revit application version management features today at getavail.com slash request dash demo. My thanks to Avail for supporting this episode of the Troxel podcast. And now let's get back to the conversation. So I, obviously Autodesk was looking for an innovation partner when it came to this kind of application of, of an innovative product on, on, building, on a building. But David, where does the digital thinking come into the, the actual physical product of the mycelium panel system? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm, and I'm glad you're asking about that. Um, I think if if we think about how buildings get made, and you know, Evan, you're you're an expert on this. Um, there's a lot of players. There's a lot of um, aspirations for each project, constraints for each project. There's um, a lot of potential risk, um, and we realized that if we were going to scale up mycelium materials and other carbon negative materials, so I hope we can get back to, to that way I'm thinking mm -hmm. about it now, um, we need those materials to be part of digital workflows. You know, so you think about how um, we get... Uh, how ideas get started and how things get modeled in the computer, how a uh, design for a project gets passed from an architect to an engineer, um, how the design advances through the stages, how things get communicated to contractors, how things get um, certified, priced, um, 
analyzed for sustainability impact. And all of that, it's really important for there to be um, data about you know things, whether that's the geometry or the materials or other aspects, and you know some way of um, analyzing and comparing things. And these days, that's basically software. Mm-hmm. You know, it's many kinds of software. It's not only Autodesk software, um, but mm-hmm. it's but a lot of that is software. So. Um, Another way of looking at the, the whole problem of decarbonizing architecture, even independent of mycelium materials, but I think uh, I'm going to try to describe where these things intersect, um, is if we're going to decarbonize architecture, we need to reduce the operational carbon. There are a lot of good digital tools for that and designs, and mm-hmm. even traditional practices. We need to be able to model and simulate that, but also increasingly the embodied carbon of materials. and. Thankfully, a lot of architects, people in AEC, are paying attention to that now. Mm-hmm. But as soon as you're thinking about um, embodied carbon and materials, you need precedence. You need to be able to simulate the structural performance of different material options. You need to know the exact carbon footprint of different materials, amount of embodied carbon. And so we thought, you know, as we were trying to do some of this innovation, that it's not only the physical buildings of Phoenix that will help, you know, be one step on potentially scaling up, but it's also getting that material innovation into digital workflows. And so um, we've been um, not only trying to simulate the material to figure out what its performance is for things like structure, noise dampening, thermal performance. Um, And those are all really critical. And those help us unlock some cost benefits. Um, So we need to do that simulation. Some of that's in the computer. Some of that's uh, physical testing. Um, Also fire fire testing. Um, But then we need to have that information available for the next designer who's going to come along or engineer or building owner who might want to use this. And including right. one of the latest things we've been doing is a full life cycle assessment of the material so that we mm. can basically you know, know in a high degree of detail with third-party verification how this material performs in terms of sustainability. So anyway, that was a long answer of how we think like, you know, if you're going to scale up innovative materials, you need, you know, the, the physical implementation, but you also need the kind of digital thread that's going to help other people do it in the future. Absolutely. You mentioned risk. And, you know, as an architect, I I just got back from the National AIA Conference on Architecture. And there's a bunch of exhibitors there all showing off their building products. And I think as an architect, a lot of, well, as architects normally do, they want to see it in, they want to see the application of it before they use it, which is hard when you're talking about a new material, right? And so to speak to your scale point of view, right, and getting it out there getting it used, having all the testing in line and at the ready for when people ask for it. I mean, all of that plays into the adoption of new building products. And we want our reputation relies on these things performing like you say they're going to, right? And like you've modeled. And so it's this is a long process. I can't imagine how hard that actually is to embark on. I mean, to talk about risk, You've taken a ton of that risk, Thomas, evocative, right? I, sorry, I said it wrong. I said it wrong. With, with Ecovative to actually put in the, the funding and the time and the science and the manufacturing and doing all of this to actually get it to the point at which somebody can actually say yes to using a new innovative product on a building. And even then, they're likely like the first ones in their area doing it and that's risky for them and so you have to be able to say you know we're partners in this and so i'm i'm wondering what the what is the story that you you're telling people publicly with a product being used on a project like phoenix to say like there there is trust in this and there's a relationship and there's collaboration and there's we've got your back and like how does that all go because i can only imagine how hard it is to like this is to me, it's a new product category, and and when you're talking about a new category, it's like 
no thanks, I'll use what I've been using for the last 20 years on my projects. I mean, that, that's just kind of normal when it goes for architects. So h- how do you start to kind of get over the objections of introducing a new material category into the building and construction industry? Well, well let, let, let me let me first, and then David, please jump in. But, you know, it's not just hard. It's also very, very frustrating, right? Because, like, there's a lot of people who are interested in it. But actually taking that step to commercially adapt it mm-hmm. is, you know, completely different story than, you know, to, to David's point on, um, you know, doing a pilot or doing something in a lab or doing something very, very small scale. But actually bringing it to a real-sized project is a completely different ball, ball game. I think um, for me, the reason why it has uh, a higher degree, uh, a higher likelihood of succeeding uh, in the Phoenix project is because you have, you know, all key stakeholders and all parties together, uh, all pulling for the same thing, right? It's generally one stakeholder that wants to bring a product in. And then there's lots of other parties who then start looking at it and saying, ah, this is the reason why we can't do it. Or this is off or the price or, you know, the testing or whatever it may be. In this case, you know, you have the architecture firm, you have the developer, uh, you have the panel manufacturer, you have Ecovative and you have David's team all coming together with one shared goal. Um, and that's to actually bring this product um, into a real uh, building. And I think that's the game changer here is having yeah. all those people together. And that's completely... Yeah to David's credit that, you know, he brought that group together and said, let's take a look at if we can actually do this, right? Forget about a mock-up or, or a lab scale. Let's see if we can actually bring this to life. Um, but yeah, J- David, jump in with, uh, yeah. with what, what your view is on it. No, I mean, I, I love that description and that, that was really true. And that was one of the most exciting things about, about the project that it really, we did have all of these stakeholders working together, you know, with the same big picture goal in mind, you know, and there was a lot of issues to solve and sometimes disagreements about how to get there, but, but it really was a collaborative group. And that is somewhat unusual, you know, because we had not only the, you know, the modular housing manufacturer factory OS, but then their development arm. So really the, the building owner as well, like was there in the room, we're all in the room. One of my favorite moments in the project at Thomas, I, I I think you may not have been at this meeting. I, you know, I'm I'm based in New York, but I was at several of the meetings in in the Factory OS office in, in the Bay Area, and you know, there was some like there were some challenges of using this innovative material, as as you know, you've already described, Thomas. Like to do good innovative work, there are always going to be challenges. And Larry Pace, you know, who is this uh, incredible veteran of the construction industry had a full career in traditional construction before deciding that construction had to be different and starting factory OS with his co-founder, um, knows everything about how to make buildings, knows every product out there, knows how much anything is going to cost, gets in there and is drawing the detail with us, even though he's, you know, the CEO, he recently passed that on. But, um, so Larry's in the meeting and someone like had the had the uh, courage, I think, you know, not necessarily in a good way, but the courage to say something like, well, what if we just don't use the mycelium on this project? <laughs> and Larry Pace, like, <laughs> took course. his big fist, slammed it oh. on the table and said, the whole point of this project and all of our work is to get this innovative material in this building in Phoenix. Wow. You know, he basically insisted that we needed mycelium in Project Phoenix. And to me, that was like, that was a huge step in itself to have someone who knows everything about construction, everything about the risks, who's going to be taking some of the risks himself, have be so bought in to this material innovation and influencing the construction industry that he just insisted on it. And and at a certain point, I'm sure every innovation story has something like this. Like you need someone like that to just say, this yeah. is the goal, we're gonna make it happen. You know, we're gonna, you know, and even if there are failures along the way, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, put this down as as the target. And so that I, I'm always gonna remember that that moment. I, I was somewhat surprised because I knew that he's so practical. This is, yeah. by the way, affordable housing. 
with a very short timeline, you know, a strict budget. And he was saying, we're going to commit to this anyway. Yeah. I, I, that's, right. That is interesting coming from the construction side as well, right? Normally, yes. as, as an architect, we, we have the crazy ideas, and I'm using my podcasting air quotes, that get shot down or value engineered out of the project. And for, I mean, project owner, but also builder to really double down and say, this is the whole point. I think that's absolutely incredible. I bet that was a, an amazing day a, a, a thing to witness, right? Because you're, you are coming at this often from the design side as well. And for the story to be owned by the contractor like that is, is a fantastic story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, well, now, I'm interested in, let's go ahead. Well, I just wanted to describe one other thing that I helped that I think helped us all unlock a little bit of the potential here. And it's it's interesting to me even to generalize from this toward other kind of innovation. But um, in this particular project, I mean, especially because, you know, maybe some some people listening um, hopefully have, have heard about mycelium, have seen it, have know what it's like, these kind of mycelium composite materials. And... Um, in this case, in taking this step for scaling up, we had to do another thing that we haven't quite talked about yet, which is combine mycelium, a very carbon negative material, sustainable material, a biomaterial, with a small amount of a traditional material. And I think mm -hmm. that step is worthwhile and important and maybe will help us get to a point where we have 100% carbon negative and biomaterial, sustainable biomaterial. Um, and so there, there are two ways to think about this in my mind. One is we have this mycelium material, which can do incredible things. It's structural. It dampens noise. It has thermal insulation. Um, most importantly for me, it's carbon negative, meaning there's uh, more carbon absorbed during the process of making it than emitted. That's because it's using the agricultural waste and all plants have absorbed carbon dioxide. So it's got all these great possibilities, you know, uh, uh, characteristics and possibilities. Um, but it has a couple of challenges in being in a real world building. And we picked one of the um, most difficult applications, which is the facade for mm -hmm. performance. Um, and a couple of challenges are um, the durability and the strength compared to other materials. Um, so for the strength, Thomas and his team did some incredible innovation um, to get us where we needed to be. And for the durability, we chose, so I sometimes think of it this way, we chose to take the mycelium material, which can be kind of a block or a panel that we're going to use in a facade, and coat it with a very small amount of a synthetic material to get the durability. So, you know, you have this material, it's like by volume, it must be like 95% or more uh, mycelium composite material. And then a very thin coating, almost like painting something on. And that is FRP, fiber reinforced polymer or fiberglass. So that's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is FRP is a high performance building facade material that's kind of taking off. It's spreading through the industry. It's got all these really interesting properties, incredibly durable, um, very lightweight. You can make huge panels out of it. They can be constructed very quickly and save you time and money. Um, and typically it would have a core material. So you have a layer of fiberglass, a layer of often foam, you know, synthetic mm -hmm. foam, polyisofoam or EPS foam, and then another layer of fiberglass. And so another way of looking at this innovation is we're going to substitute the core material. We're going to take out the polyiso or EPS, and we're going to put in this uh, biomaterial, mycelium composite material. Now we're going to have something that has all of the advantages, existing advantages of FRP facades, but one additional advantage which is the uh, the uh, carbon footprint, the sustainability. Right. And, and so that's been really important. I think the vision is we can get to a facade one day, maybe in another 10 years, but don't quote me on it, where it's going to be 100% uh, organic 
biocomposite facade. But for now, this step is really important because we can get the best of both worlds. Um, and crucially, we can still get a carbon negative facade. So overall, it's got a negative yeah. carbon footprint. And then we have all of the advantages of FRP, which, and it made me think of it again, because that has helped us pass a lot of the tests, you know, because we have this composite. And I think it's a, a, a totally valid step along the way to the, the most radical sustainable future we can have. We need these steps like this, which are, a, you know, a step along the way. It's not all the way yet there yet, but it's an important step. When you're talking about pre, go for it, Thomas. Oh, I was just going to add. I think you know the the the, the Chrysler panels. You know, obviously, um, alleviated a lot of concerns as well, right? I mean, mm. it's what we were talking about before. You know, how does it perform long term? Where is this? Bio what does it actually look like in real life? Cut, having the mycelium material being completely enclosed, right, wrapped in a proven material, kind of took all of those uh, concerns away. And you would say, okay, you know, from a performance in terms of being exposed to the elements or or, or other risks that you're taking, um, it kind of pushed that risk down a lot uh, because FRP is a proven material. Um, and by doing it like this, almost in a step, step-by-step yeah. basis, it made it uh, a lot more palatable, I think, uh, for people on, on that whole project team um, and for us as well. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I think that, that this is kind of the natural progression to get from one end of the pendulum to the other, right? You, you've got to have s step change along the way. And so the gradient of, you know, what what is what makes sense for people to adopt it because you have proven technologies marrying that in a composite sense with an unproven technology to to get over those objections, I think makes a ton of sense. And I and also coming from a durability standpoint, as an architect of public projects over the years, like this is the very first thing that anybody who builds a school or, you know, you've got affordable housing projects, like there's going to be the owner who's going to be like, you know, they don't have a huge windfall of a budget for building maintenance, right? I mean, we've, we've all experienced this. It's like buildings... Buildings don't go through the car wash like your car does, and, and, and so they don't maintain themselves, right? And so when you're thinking about the durability uh, and maintenance staff and having to, even, even from an industrialized construction standpoint, of having to ship these things, and things get banged up in shipping, right? Like that's normal too. And so thinking about it from the standpoint of it, this logistically has to work. You have to get it from the manufacturing facility to the site and transportation is not like a, a touchless pro process, right? So thinking about all of those things, I mean, this totally makes sense. And, and Thomas, I'm just wondering if you can kind of paint a picture of what this product actually looks and feels like, because that's something we haven't really talked about. I know we had a lot of, you had a lot of great samples on display at Autodesk University that you, people could pick up and touch. And there was different kind of texture levels and, and things like that to this product. But if you could maybe describe what we're talking about here to give the audience an idea of, of what it looks and feels like, that would be fantastic. Yeah, so uh, I think the, the composites uh, product, when it's finally said and done, obviously, you know, we, we grow these things in molds. Um, you can do it in very large molds or in small molds. Um, it's a, a hemp herd, so it's basically a, a waste uh, material from the fibers industry um, that we then mix with the mycelium and then it self-assembles and eventually will grow it a little bit more. It takes about five days um, for that material to, to, to bind and, and grow. Um, we take it out of the mold and let it grow for another day. And then we dehydrate it in a, in a large-scale uh, oven or, or a dehydrator or a kiln. Um, and the final product then feels a little bit like, um, think of it as a, a slightly heavier, more natural feeling styrofoam or EPS, right? It's, um, it's, uh, it feels like it's almost, um, like an, like an e-wood type of, uh, material, mm -hmm. um, that if you overgrow it properly, right, if you have a little bit of a layer of mycelium around it should feel soft and velvety, um, mm. but you can also grow it very hard where if you rub your hand over it, it feels more like um, kind of uh, unbrushed wood almost, uh, like, a, like a rough wood type surface. Um, right. So, you know, that's, that's really what it looks like. And then 
obviously with the um uh, well Dave you could probably speak to this better but um with the FRP panel around it you know it feels like a, a regular FRP panel you just don't mm -hmm. know what's inside right inside is the right. the mycelium material as opposed to a poly ISO or an EPS um so yeah it's uh that's kind of the final final product this episode is made possible with support from Avail Along with their newly released Revit application version management, AEC software company Avail has added another powerful new workflow feature called Palettes to its suite of content management capabilities. Palettes are user-customized lists of content in Avail and can function as a favorites list, as starter content for a specific project, or to drive workflows such as redlining construction details. Customers administrators can add Palettes to their accounts through the Avail Manage Portal page today. Interested in seeing pallets in action first? Request a demo at getavail.com slash request dash demo. Avail helps AECO firms better manage, organize, and navigate information faster. My thanks to Avail for supporting this episode of the Troxel podcast. And now let's return to the conversation. And speaking about kind of performance characteristics, can you list out Kind of what you're seeing, what what, and maybe even go back to maybe what you thought the possibilities were, and then what has transpired throughout the creation of these panels. David, you want to take that? Yeah, I can. I can get. I can get started with the overview, but I think Thomas, you you obviously have more yeah. of the fine grain of detail. But um, you know, um, we talked before about all the players in in the room trying to work together and. Um, there were a lot of really interesting moments where we were listening to each other, brainstorming together, and something that really was um, helpful and unlocked the, some possibilities for me was hearing Andrew from Factory OS, who I know, Evan, you know, we've talked to before, um, mm -hmm. talking about how um, a facade, the facade in the modular housing uh, assembly process is one of those you know challenging things. You can make the boxes in the factory, but you got to put the facade on in the field for the most part, unless you innovate. Um, you know because you got to stitch the boxes together and the waterproofing. Right. It's easier to do that on the whole building, not on each module, sure. etc. So he he was just talking about the inefficiency of that process and the five things that he has to do in the field to make these facades work. And he ticked them off and they've become part of my my thinking ever since. Uh, let's hope, hope I can remember them. I mean, the, the first one is structural. You gotta you know, connect the boxes together, especially laterally. Um, then you need waterproofing, you need fire resistance, you need noise dampening, and you need thermal insulation. And often these are separate trades going on and it takes a long time it's back to traditional construction and it costs a lot of money because it's take taking more time um and we started to realize maybe our hybrid facade with the mycelium and the frp could provide two of these or even three of these and now we're aiming for five of these layers of performance nice. so that is that's been my list it starts with like what do they need to do in the field to get this building completed? Those five layers that aren't already part of those boxes, you know. But this is this is generalizable to non-modular construction as well. Um, and we've been seeing that, you know, kind of remarkably, mycelium material helps with the fire rating. And we've done those fire tests, and we've, you know, done them to. Um, specifications, we've passed the Class A fire rating for buildings in California under 30 stories as the assembly of mycelium and fiberglass. Um, we're doing even further tests right now for the noise dampening, which already the material came with Thomas and Ecovate have had these tests saying, yes, it's going to be good for noise dampening. We have some data about thermal performance. And the other, uh, and the structure we've, we've been working on together. Um, the waterproofing will come just through the detailing of the assembly. But so we're able to get those five layers of performance or, or we're optimistic. Some we've proven already, some are in process. And that will unlock not only like a good facade, a high performance facade, but really essentially cost. Because if we can take a single 38 mm -hmm. foot long panel and assemble it 
pretty quickly in the field without scaffolding, then we can save, you know, as many as five plus months of construction time. And that will unlock, you know, obviously cost savings that might make it worth it to spend a little more per square foot on this material, just yeah, of the sure. of the material itself. But, I, you know, and Thomas, you've been instrumental. You, you know, when we came to you and we said, we were already working on this and we said, okay, let's let's work on the fire. You were like, here, we've got done all these tests. We have all this data, here's this stuff. And when we said, now let's talk about noise, you said, yes, here's it. You know, but for structure, and you also said we've done all this stuff, but we did some more together, you know, just for this project. So we've really been you know, working to, to make it work for this project, which we think will be generalizable to a lot of other projects. Yeah, and I think that's been the most surprising thing to us, at least about the project, right? It's uh, when you came to us, it was, it is really only a replacement uh, of the existing filler material, right? Um, doesn't necessarily have to perform as well. And I think we knew that the material uh, would pass fire rating. We also knew that it had um, some thermal insulation value um, and some acoustic and, and good acoustic properties. Um, what we didn't know, what we've been surprised about, and that's definitely you know credit to how much work we all have done on testing it and implementing it in the right way, is how that whole package performs together. Um, not just from, from a performance, but also from a structural perspective, right? We were very uh, uh, concerned about, you know, is this actually going to hold up? Uh, can you actually um, use the mycelium and bind it in a way inside an FRP panel that will then also allow you to appropriately put it on the outside of a building? Um, I think what all of these tests are showing um, is that there's a path to getting that done and not just benefiting from, oh, look, there's a funky, uh, you know, carbon negative material inside, but actually that material performs as well and actually has yeah. an attribute to, you know, the speed of the construction uh, and to what other materials you can strip out as a, as a result of that performance, right? And I think that's been the biggest learning uh, for us and I think um, shows, shows very promising. It's very interesting to hear how you're kind of ticking all those boxes, and I can see why it would be so attractive, obviously, to especially in terms of speed, but also to your point about cost, David, right? To When you are replacing four or five other things with a single thing, that makes a huge difference. And and you mentioned weatherproofing. So it, it doesn't sound like this is acting as a rain screen, like you have to have a vapor barrier, barrier behind it. And you said you were going to accomplish that through detailing. Maybe you could just talk a little bit more about at least the direction you're going there, because I think that's another thing that architects who are listening to this might be interested in hearing about. Yeah. Um, so that's very much uh, in, in process right now um, in the final stage. The the version that you saw, um, Evan, that we were presenting at Autodesk University was detailed as a rain screen. So we went in okay. and we said, look how amazing this could be with, you know, if this was an integrated system, not a rain screen. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone said, yes, yes. Um, but, and I remember, I don't know who came up with this, but, well, I know it's a common expression, but someone said, let's walk before we run the very first version, let's prove that we can make a 38 foot long panel, get the detailing right, get the tolerances right, you know, get all the, yeah. you know, numbers for the testing, fire, acoustic, et cetera, you know, and then if that works, then we'll do an integrated system. I believe mm -hmm. this was kind of coming from the factory OS side and it made total sense. Look, I mean, that that's yeah, the sure. way to get things done, right? And right. everyone had the, their eyes on the prize. But after we did that full-scale mock-up, um, Factory OS said, you know what, let's go for the integrated system. Let's, mm. let's see what it would take to, to do that. And that's what we're, we're currently working on now. The biggest challenge is, I mean, the panels themselves, entirely waterproof. I mean, it's the same type of fiberglass, more or less. I mean... It's just the edges, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just where two yeah. come together. Right. But it's the right. same material that's used for boats. So obviously it's in itself yeah. is, is waterproof. Now I'm sure our great partner, Bill Chrysler and Chrysler Associates, um, they've got their own proprietary form of FRP and it, you know, it's, it's highly engineered. It's incredible. They've got a whole, you know, yeah. 
a career in, in super high performance, incredible FRP. So it is, you know, even more than a, a traditional fi fiberglass. Um, but within that unit itself, we're totally good. It all comes down to the detailing between two units. Well, and, and then we also learned, it, to, to my surprise, from Factory House's point of view, um, it's it wasn't that hard to get the um, connection and the and the detailing between the box and the panel. It's all about panel to panel detailing. Yeah, right. You know, so, um, but but everyone's pretty confident that that, that can work. I want to ask about size and shape because I, again, to just kind of complete the picture for people who are listening uh like I, i've seen it in person but but i'm interested in I, I i assume you can you can do anything within you know a certain range right yes shape like how it act the flutes and and the you know because it's a mold you can kind of go crazy <laughs> yeah i i think that's right and and so you know thomas will describe this but um for for the you know both both materials you know the the synthetic material and the natural material um, are created with molds, oh. and so they can be any any size and, and shape, you know. But okay. but there's some details of that which I don't know if they get too technical, but about how you can have a single 38 foot long FRP. Um, in theory, you can have a single 38 foot long mycelium composite, but we decided to to do it in a more modular way this time. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Nice. Thomas, can you talk about size and shape a little bit? Because, you know, David's mentioned 38 feet. Um, and if you could describe shape and and kind of what the possibilities are with with aesthetics, because you're doing this in a mold, I assume that there's there's a lot of possibility, but maybe just describe how it looks and feels a little bit more. Yeah, there, there are uh, a lot of possibilities that, that that's correct. Um, you can really make any shape or form uh, with the mycelium. Now, the, the the trick is in how do you scale that, right? So how we have initially scaled the business for our packaging uh, uh, product um, is that it is a mold that goes into a baker's rack and then, you know, you will grow those um, and eventually you'll roll them into a, into an oven. The downside there is that you'll, ha you'll need to have one flat surface, right? Because mm -hmm. you're growing it in a surface uh, or in a mold and then you take them out which will always have as a result that, you know, one surface is flat. Now, that doesn't necessarily have to be a limiting factor here. We have made fully round things and completely other things by having two uh, panels uh, grow together, right? So after the initial stage, you can um, then bind them together by letting the mycelium bind the two uh, shapes together. So there's lots of different things you can do. Um, the, limit the limiting factor, obviously, is how do you scale that, right? So how mm -hmm. do you actually make sure that you have a surface or a form uh, or a shape that you can actually replicate fast and low, low cost, low cost um, uh, from a low cost perspective. Um, what I would be really interested to see in the future, like like David mentioned, that if we can grow this material directly into a panel, right, a, a massive three mm -hmm. foot panel, uh, where we let the mycelium grow and self assemble. Um, and then finish uh, finish the panel off. That that would be an ideal situation from a cost perspective. Um, but yeah, in theory, there are no limitations, right? Our technology is being used for things from building materials, relatively simple shapes, right, uh, to pretty intricate packaging packaging products, all the way to uh, human coffins, right? As you you know, you can imagine that there's lots of different shapes and forms uh, that they've experimented with and um yeah that's actually been pretty pretty successful so yeah there's not not a lot of, of limitations there other than how you set up your production facility and how you scale it and i think that's the nut that needs to be cracked um in order to scale this up and just to make one other quick connection um that's another area where the digital workflow can be very important you know because like you're saying thomas you can basically make any size, well, any shape, and then eventually any size. And, you know, you can translate really directly between 3D geometry and the computer and the shape of a mold. And you can do that mm -hmm. both with the mycelium product and the FRP product. So mm -hmm. the same digital model, you know, standard offsets and things like that. 
So it does. But I think, Evan, part of your point might be um, this is not only a 38 foot long panel that's carbon negative and durable and can be used today, but well, and it could be 30 foot or 40 foot, whatever. Um, but it's got a lot of aesthetic possibilities. So yeah. it's not like it's one color and one flatness and one aesthetic. You can make almost anything with it. Um, and I think that's exciting yeah. too, to say if it's going to scale up, it can't just be like one, one finish. It's got to have and, and you're getting a, possibilities. And you're getting a two for there too, I assume, uh, from, from trying to recall what I saw and just kind of putting two and two together. Uh, I don't think I heard this explicitly is this has to do with the, the sound attenuation that you're going for, right? Like you're, you're trying to, the project Phoenix is, is near a, a, a highway or a freeway. And so there's, I mean, noise attenuation is a huge issue on this project. And so what we see in these outward facing panels is getting you something else as well, right? And this is all part of that digital workflow because you need to be able to model this and test it ahead of time so that you can do some, some modeling to, to, to see how it's going to react in that actual environment before you, you do it. And so I assume that the fluting that we see on these panels has to do with that as well. Yes, exactly. Right. And so in, in short, if, if people are imagining, it's like it, we can make the, the facade thicker where it needs more noise attenuation and also in some ways more privacy because it can cause a, you know, a thicker facade with less, you know, views inside an apartment um, and, and thinner where it doesn't need that. And also the geometry itself, you know, a, a little bit like you, you imagine if you're like in a recording studio, mm -hmm. um, you know, you have like sound, a, a flat panels, wall is the yeah. worst. Yeah. But if right. you have uh, more, you know, shape, then you can help um, kind of uh, confuse diffuse the noise. The yeah, noise. Diffuse yeah. it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So cool. What are we missing here in this in this story? I, I, it, so f the, it's fascinating, but I don't want to miss anything, right? So is there is there anything that we haven't covered in this? I mean, this project is yet to be built, and you've you've put some some verbal disclaimers out there, like talking about future and you know the future of where this is headed, and obviously this is a direction, and there's a ladder to get there. Like we're on some step on that ladder to get where this potentially could go. But is there anything else part of Project Phoenix story or the Ecovative story and the Autodesk story of the collaboration between you two that we haven't touched on that you think still needs to be brought up? There's one thing. thing well, there's one thing that um, has always stuck with me. And Thomas, I'm, I'm curious for your, your thoughts on this at this point. Um, so again, back back 10 years ago, um, when I was so excited about the, the future of mycelium materials and also trying to convince others, starting with convincing the original jury for the competition that, you know, our project was important and relevant for the industry and things like that. Um, one thing I cited, and I hope this is accurate, um, was that um, 3M, the big materials company, the inventor of scotch tape and post-its, and, and in essence, we could say like the ultimate pinnacle of chemical-based materials. I mean, and I did a project with them. I visited their facilities and these guys are incredible at engineering with chemicals. And at the time, 10 years ago, 3M had just invested in Ecovated. And I believe I, I heard this or someone told it to me and so I hope it's accurate. My memory is accurate. But 3M said, you know, why are they, the ultimate chemicals company, investing in biomaterials? You know, mm -hmm. and even back then, some people were saying bio is the future. You know, the 21st century is going to be the century of biology. Um, even uh, Steve Jobs is known for saying something like, we're going to have more innovation in the bio age than we've ever had in the computer age, things like that. Mm -hmm. So that, that wave was starting. But 3M, I think, said a little more practically, we think that mycelium has the potential to be a materials platform like plastics is a materials platform. And oh, my man, interpretation of that yeah. is, <laughs> like, think of everything we can make with plastics. We can make clothing. We can make 
rigid materials, we can make flexible materials, we can make foam-like mm -hmm. materials, some can be transparent, some can be opaque. You can basically do a anything. Like the, the, It's a platform, right? Like almost anything you want. You can make a bag, it could be disposable, it can be permanent. Of course, we know a lot of problems with plastic, and even back then it was known. But but the critical thing to me was platform. Like, And my interpretation, again, was, you know, there are many species of mycelium. There, you're already proving it, Thomas, even more than 10 years ago, that you can make food out of this. You can make fabric-like, leather-like things out of it. Mm -hmm. You can make brick-like things out of it. And more and more, you can make wood-like things out of it. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's I think that's really exciting. You know, and again, returning to the thing that's always on my mind, decarbonization and climate change, that is a powerful thing. If you're trying to decarbonize buildings and you have a new materials platform that is biodegradable and organic and with a negative carbon footprint, that is worth a lot of attention. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't have said it better, uh, David. I, and I think that's that's exactly how we look at uh, the Ecovative as a as a platform company um, that does uh, that has that will eventually have a number of verticals um, trying to replace plastics or other materials, right? And yeah, you know, just going to, tapping into what you said about plastics. You know, the, the difficult thing is competing actually with plastics, right? Because it's such a great yeah. material. I mean, it's a crap material, but it's a great material, right? It's odorless, it's smooth, it's, you can have, you can have any, any color, any surface, any shape. And that's an incredibly hard thing to reposition, you know, society's uh, perspective. And, and um, I think uh, the even trickier thing about it is matching up society's perspective and gov government pressure on replacing plastics or, or other materials that are petroleum-based. Um, and how quickly can get companies there and how do they get their bottom line there, right? Like that is the tricky thing. And we are now seeing that, you know, obviously COVID for 17 years and um, the, pro the, the composites technology that we were talking about uh, has been around for 17 years. And the tricky thing is that, you know, you need to match up momentum with where the adapters actually are. And I think mm. that getting those two things to align is incredibly difficult, right? Um, whether yep. from a food perspective or materials or or, or a uh, building and construction materials perspective, getting uh, excitement in, uh, uh, you know, the wider public's eye to align with, are there companies who are willing to take the bet, pay a little bit more, and thereby, you know, drive innovation and adaptation of new products? Getting those two, th those three things to align at the same moment is incredibly difficult. Um, but we're very uh, confident in uh, in in our ability to get there. Um, and yeah, we think um, well, we agree with your view, David, that Mycelium has uh, a lot uh, of uh, of of new products to bring uh, to the table. And I think we're only scratching the surface. Um, you know. Commercial mushroom growing has not been around for that long, right? It's only been 150 years or so um, compared to tens of thousands of years on domesticating animals and um, growing crops. So, you know, we think um, that's how we eventually look at mycelium as a new crop uh, for the future um, that will bring uh, different materials uh, to, the, uh, to, to society and to the economy. So, yeah, we're definitely excited about that. My mycelium has just been quietly waiting to be noticed, right? <laughs> for so long, for so long. And the the application potential is incredible. Uh, the And the sweet spots that you've identified right here on this project as kind of a case study to prove it to architects and builders who are looking for innovative ways to address the very real challenges that we're all dealing with from so many different angles and kind of ticking all of those boxes that you both have outlaid here on this episode today shows that they do exist, right? And and this is something worth really investigating. And, and, I, and I'm hoping that there will be opportunities for people in these industries to really see it in action, go to the project, 
and talk about it and touch it and feel it and really see how it's performing because I know we, we need a lot of convincing as well. Like I said earlier, our reputations are on the line, but even more so than that, like it, it actually has to perform. It has to be one of those things that, that really lives up to everything that we're, we're hoping it can do. So this has been a great episode, a great conversation. Thank you both so much for taking the time to share about it today. And I look forward to that time in the future wherever we can tour the project and, and see it for real. It, that that would be absolutely fantastic. It, it was great to see the displays and kind of the where you were at back in November at Autodesk University. But um, in construction terms, this is moving relatively quickly, and, and I can't wait to see it in action. Great. Thank you so much, Evan. Great to talk to you, Thomas. Yeah, likewise, Thank David, you. and thanks for having us, Evan.